Okay, welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I come from the acting background. And I'm Josh Knapp. I'm broadcast engineer. Here we go. All right, today we're going to talk about Best Actress Academy Award winners, but uh, I think first we'll just kind of talk about what we've been watching recently since we haven't done that for a while. So what have you been watching? Just catching up on the TV shows. Haven't done any movies recently, which is strange. Yeah, yeah. Nothing from Redbox recently. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's been a few... Oh, um, the... uh, um, I can't think tonight, so forgive me. Um, (laughs) Philadelphia Story was on uh, TCM, so I watched that. I caught it about 15 minutes into it, which was really interesting, because I go back and forth with that film. Is that Cary Grant the lead, or is Jimmy Stewart the lead? This time I thought Jimmy Stewart (laughs) was the supporting actor. I don't... It's one of those weird ones where... Yeah, well, because Cary Grant kind of comes in at the beginning, and then he's gone for a while, and then, you know, I mean, he comes back in again, and they get it all integrated together by the end. Yeah, he seems to show up a lot more at the end than I seem mm-hmm. to remember i've seen it a couple of times but he, he seems to show up a lot more than i remember but jimmy stewart seemed to have stuck out the first couple of times that i saw it so because there is that little bit of i don't think it's a controversy but most people think jimmy stewart won best actor for that because he didn't win for mr smith goes to washington yeah. which i'm not on that fence I, I i fall on the side that i like that he won for the philadelphia story but um some people think he should have been supporting actor for that. Mm-hmm. You know, first time I saw it, I thought he was the lead because, like we just discussed, you know, he seems to be there more prominent. And he's also very, uh, uh, he's kind of more like the the normal guy would be. You know, you're, you're, it's easier to relate with him than it is to relate with the Cary Grant character, I think. Yeah, but I also think that it's a sort of step out of what Jimmy Stewart normally does or James Stewart normally does. He seems to, you know, the whole drunk scene, he's sort of the buffoon, but with sophistication. And he's a tad bit obnoxious, you know, when he goes over to Cary Grant's house at four o'clock in the morning. Do you remember that? Yeah. And his name's like CK something. And he's, he's like, CK, I want to talk to you. <laughs> you know, he's a bit, he's a bit obnoxious. So yeah. it's, it's not anything I've ever seen him do before or after so so yeah i saw that i'm just watching i'm catching up with american horror story season three Mm -hmm. coven about the witches yeah so just tv shows right now so yeah the only one i'm watching the only tv show i'm watching right now is uh newsroom on uh, hbo that's on my netflix list too yeah yeah and that uh i i like that i mean i like aaron sorkin so that's his baby so um it sometimes it's a little overwrought as far as like his dialogue and I mean, he's very pointed and he has the, the newsroom is basically based on real events that have happened in the past. And it's how this particular fake news uh, channel deals with those events. So he has the, uh, you know, the luxury of hindsight. So like if this happened, what would be the perfect way to handle this or what would be oh, okay. an interesting way to handle this and, and how, how you can shape that? You know, he's making comment on 24 hour news and all that stuff. But at the same time, he's still pushing his agenda, which some of it I agree with and some of it I don't. So I heard there's he's a, gotta sift through it. a lot of dialogue, like pages oh. and pages of dialogue. Well, it's like the West Wing. If you ever saw that, yeah, I mean, you which just, I, people are just firing stuff. Yeah, I love the West Wing. Yeah, and it's quick, and there's a lot of, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like those older, um, those older screwball comedy type movies where there's just bunches and bunches of dialogue, and there's certain jokes or jabs or you know small you know callbacks that you may not even catch if you're not listening very closely. Oh, I like things. So like that. yeah, you got to be on your toes when you're watching that movie or when you're watching that show. So, um, and then uh, movies that I've watched, it's pretty much just been me and my wife watched a couple of movies that we just had readily available. We watched uh, Jurassic Park for the first time in probably 10 years, and that movie holds up. Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, and I'm very, very picky about CGI and how it looks, and there's a couple of scenes in there. I can't say, I can't give it an A+, plus as far as like comparing it to today's movies right but even today's movies i mean even like you know captain america the new captain america that came out this year or even like you know transformers i mean you've got hundreds upon hundreds of people working on these movies and there's so many special effect shots you would think that they've got it down to a science by 2014 but you compare some of the scenes in those movies to 
a lot of the scenes in Jurassic Park and it is hard to tell the difference. I mean, it really, especially like the, the, the T-Rex scenes, the, the CGI shots, because there are certain shots that were CGI and certain shots You're that right. weren't. Because they built a full-scale they model, built, right? Yeah, full-scale yeah. models of all of those. That worked, and yeah. If, it just as I mean, if it's a scene where like the Velociraptor, you see the whole body of it. Yeah, that's CGI. Or if you like the T Rex running behind the Jeep. Yeah, that's CGI. But when it's the T Rex's face and he's bumping up against the you know bump, bump, bumping up against the Explorer, then you know yeah, that's that's an animatronic. That's a robotic type thing. But I mean the the shading, the lighting. I mean it, it the textures, how the skin moves, all that stuff is. It's perfect. I mean, I, I was I was amazed after ten years, you know, have, not having seen it. I was kind of scared to go back to it, but it looked beautiful. I mean, we saw it on Blu-ray. And it was well, great. they interviewed the kid, kids, and they said, "How did you get so scared?" Scared, and they were like, "It was the size of a real T Rex coming through the window of the car." You know, when the when they have that pane of glass yeah. over, yeah. And she's like, "It's a piece of glass between us and this." big huge monster with teeth there wasn't an acting need act. yeah it's not needed <laughs> at all yeah yeah I, I enjoy that film yeah it was good i mean there's some like cheesy dialogue in there but i think that um jeff goldblum is i mean jeff goldblum i mean yeah. i don't know if he ad-libbed some of those lines but he's kind of like a christopher walken where you put him in a role and he's gonna make it his own right it you can't not do that I mean, he, he just, it seems like he as an actor can't not do that. You know, I yeah. don't know of any, I mean, maybe young Christopher Walken, but, and even like, I don't know, the earliest Jeff Goldblum movie I saw was probably The Fly in 84, something like that. Right. And, and I mean, he still was gold blooming it up. I mean, he was gold definitely, it up. <laughs> he definitely had his own little quirks. But uh, the other movie that we saw recently was uh, Social Network. Oh, uh, really? Fincher movie. You just picked them out of your collection well, and just said, let's so watch them? It's kind of weird. We watched them one after the other. We watched Jurassic Park uh, a couple nights ago, and then last night we threw in social network. We were actually just listening to soundtracks like because we'll, we'll do that if you're if we're working on the computer or whatever. Um, and then I, that's kind of in my rotation of soundtracks. Um, there's some really good soundtracks to listen to. Maybe we could do a whole episode on that at some point but you know i really i listened to all those trent reznor soundtracks from all the david fincher movies those are all good the moon soundtrack is good uh the last few uh wes anderson movies their soundtracks moonrise kingdom that soundtrack is great or i mean it's it's like a score basically because there's it's a lot of um it, there's not a lot of like you know vocals or anything and it's not a compilation of pre-recorded music it's their scores um but but yeah, there's there's a few of them that are that are really good and they're good to just have on in the background and they don't you know they're not obtrusive but they're really well. You really were cool. saying before we started that you're also gonna watch Hamlet, the Mel Gibson Hamlet, right? That's right. Yeah. I own that soundtrack, that score, and cool. I was listening to it late night once. It is creepy. I had to turn it off. I was like, this is really disturbing me. It didn't. Re it doesn't. Re you know what a great score does? It doesn't necessarily remind you of the film. It, it, it's an entity all its own. Mm -hmm. And when you're listening to it, it might remind you of the movie or specific scenes, but a really great score will take you away from that and just give you that musical experience while you're listening to it. Mm -hmm. That Hamlet soundtrack is. It's definitely. It's wow. eerie. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, the the two soundtracks I think this year that are definitely worth listening to are we talked about the Birdman yeah, soundtrack last absolutely. week, absolutely, and the Under the Skin is oh yeah 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 creepy yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it is creepy. Yeah. Um, but uh, the other movie that we watched, Social Network, I was talking to Steph when we were watching uh, when we were watching Jurassic Park, and I to I showed I pointed to the kid, the little kid, and I was like. He was in Social Network. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And she's like, really? And then so we were listening to the soundtrack. She's like, we should watch Social Network. So we threw it in, and we got to see Joseph Mazzello as a grown-up person. Yeah, because he's one of the programmers, right? He's Dustin. He's kind yeah. of like the third guy yeah. in the in the as the, in the roommate situation. Right. Um. And and so he was kind of like interspersed back there. He wasn't a huge part of the movie, but he was in there a few few times. He was the inspiration for the relationship status. He walks into Mark as he's working in the computer lab and says, hey, do you know Janice from your computer science class? Do you know if she's got a boyfriend? And then Mark Zuckerberg just drops everything and runs up to his house or runs to his 
dorm room and post, you yeah. know, sets it up that way. Possibly another thing Zuckerberg stole from somebody else. And well, that's kind of the point of that. Not yeah. the point of that movie, but that's kind of like the, you know, the, the bent of that movie is like he's kind of trying to take all of this on for himself, but he had contributions along the way. Well, I say kind of kidding because a friend of mine and I got into this huge debate whether or not he took it from those guys, whether or not his idea, you know, all this back and forth, back and forth. And she says, I'm going to rely on what he says. If you had created Facebook, you would have created Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but there are a few things. Cause I read the book right after I saw the movie too. Mm -hmm. Um, and you were telling me that they were simultaneous. They, so the book deal, um, Ben Mesrick got the book deal at the same time. He got the money to write the book at the same time that, the book was optioned as a film. So it was kind of like, we need a, we need a, an, th- okay, so not Dustin, but the other guy, um, Saverin, Eduardo Saverin. Right. Played by Garfield, Andrew Garfield. He was the one that had basically said like, hey, do you want to write a book about me? And, you know, the, uh, the publishing, uh, publishing company, you know, paid him for that. And so got... Ben Mesrick attached to him, who's the the author, um, who wrote the book that Twenty One, the movie Twenty One, was based based on, which all goes back to Kevin Spacey, by the way. Right. So uh, Kevin Spacey was an executive producer on on Social Network. So anyway, so Ben Mesrick got the got the book deal, and they started f- trying to figure out who was going to direct the movie and who was going to write the movie. And I remember when all this was kind of coming together, I was you know reading movie blogs and stuff, and it was a couple different people were, were bandied about, but then they settled on Aaron Sorkin to write and David Fincher to direct. And so initially I was kind of like, oh, geez, Facebook movie, this is going to be horrible. It's just going to be people like posting, you know, posting things in the camera showing it. But then once I realized that David Fincher was on it and Aaron Sorkin was on it, I was like, okay, this is It was be a good. front runner. They, yeah. they weren't sure until the envelope was open on Oscar and night. Did you see the- that the Hollywood Awards happened this week? Yeah, but I'm not... <laughs> I have to honestly say I don't know what those are. I didn't know either. They, this is the first time they were televised. Okay. They were televised on CBS. Yeah, I saw that got too. really bad ratings con- considering... I mean, it was like four, 4 million... Pe- no. It was like a four rating. So anyway. But uh, yeah, it, I don't know if they're going to televise it again. But it's just not... It's not even like a director's guild or producer's guild or anything like that. It's just a cobbled together group of anonymous professionals in the industry that give out these awards but gone girl won a bunch of awards they're um slotting her for best actress nomination that's good yeah which i think we talked about i think we talked about that she was interesting enough to be up there and halfway through the film i thought is she a supporting character or is she a lead character and then you can't do that movie without her and mm-hmm. you know she's not a likable person in the end mm-hmm. uh you know but she had to pull that off, and I believed it. And we talked about when she did the thing to her nose, when mm-hmm. I finally went, wait, this this lady is definitely, how do you play that? You can't play it insane because she's committed to it as a human being, meaning the real person. Mm-hmm. But as the actress, how do you play that? And she pulled it off. I mean, because at first you kind of loved her. And then mm-hmm. she she's playing you the whole time. Yeah. And that's not easy to play. It's not, I don't know exactly the acting terms you would call it, but it it's not easy. I think we talked about that when we talked about Gone Girl, that yeah. she could possibly be nominated. They're also saying this is a weak year for actresses, which brings us to our subject tonight. But yeah. they're saying it's, kind, they always kind of say it's a weak year and then these five great people show up. And uh, But you know whose year they're saying it is, is Julianne Moore. For, for the map of the stars, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, when yeah. is that coming out? Like late, late? I'm not sure. They all kind of pile up and get premiered before December 25th, which Sometimes is it's hard to see those yeah, before the end of the year. Yeah, it really is. Sometimes you have to really. It goes down to the wire. Most of the time, they put them out on Redbox or rent them before the award show actually happen so if you didn't get a chance to because sometimes films are only released in certain cities and they qualify for the Oscars because I think you only have to show your film once in the public in a public theater by by midnight on December 25th one time okay. to a paying audience I believe that's the rule 
And then you don't have to show it again until after the Oscars. I mm -hmm. mean, technically, you should because it's you know a promotional tool. tool mm -hmm. And then some things come back. You know, they do a, a second run. Boys Don't Cry with Hilary Swank yeah. was a second run film. Well, Beasts of the Southern Wild, did that come out again? Because no. I, I didn't hear about that until it got nominated. I saw that on Redbox. Okay. I saw they came out on Redbox. That year, a lot of things were on Redbox first, but I tracked it from the beginning. From the beginning of the award ceremony time, which I guess is now, I started going, okay, that one's coming out, but... This one's already come out, so this one will make it to Redbox, and you can actually look it up when it's coming out. Once the movie's been released and out of the theater, you can go on to Redbox and Netflix and say when's the approximate day. It hardly ever changes. And then you can guesstimate, okay, I can see this one in the theater. I can see this one. That's how I do it. That's how mm -hmm. I see all the nominations. Cool. My mom thinks I'm nuts, but hey, that's, no, no, no. that's how I get it in. It's good. That's good. Uh, all right, so do you want to start talking about uh, Best Actress sure. winners and nominees? Absolutely. I do all have right. to start off with saying that this categ category for me at the Oscars is always the least interesting. Okay. And it's not because this whole thing about there aren't enough roles for women of substance, roles that are substance for women. It's that this always seems predestined by Oscar night. The person who's the front runner usually wins. And I'm not saying they shouldn't win. I'm just saying it's not as exciting. Like I like the best supporting actress um, category. I think we talked about this because there's always a chance. Like last year, Lupita Nyong'o won, but Jennifer Lawrence very easily could have won. Mm -hmm. They went back and forth, back and forth all season long. You know, one won the Golden Globe, one won the BAFTA. Back and forth, back, back and forth. Actually, Jennifer Lawrence won both, but Lupita Nyong'o won the Screen Actors Guild, so forth and so on. This category here for me is not as interesting. That said, when I went back and looked at the whole list, I kept saying, oh, I've seen that movie. Oh, I've seen her. Oh, I've seen that movie. Oh, I've seen that performance. I think I've seen more of these performances than any of the other acting Oscars. Wow. Yeah, because when I was looking at the supporting actor uh, Oscar nominations, I was like, yeah, I haven't seen a lot of these up until a certain year. Mm -hmm. I, I go kind of far back with the actress category. Well, that's great. Yeah, so I just listed um, the ones that stuck out for me, and then I have a whole list of who, who did win and who was nominated, so we can go wherever you want to go with it. Sounds good. I mean, so what's your uh, what's your earliest uh, actress you want to talk about? Ginger Rogers. Okay. Ginger Rogers has a Best Actress Oscar. And for me, I went, wait, what? Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers? Mm-hmm. Ginger Rogers has an Oscar? What does Ginger Rogers has, have an Oscar for? It's a movie called Kitty Foyle. Have you ever seen it? No. I luckily caught it on uh, Turner Classic Movies one night. I was like, oh, this is the movie that she was nominated for the Oscar. And this is true. About 35 minutes into it, completely forgot about the fact that she won the Oscar. Mm -hmm. And about 45 minutes into it, I'm like, she should have won the Oscar for this. And I was like, <laughs> wait, she did. This is that movie. Uh -huh. It's a very complicated movie. In short, it's basically about a woman who lives in Philadelphia, wants to move to New York, New York for a different social atmosphere, and marries one guy, marries another guy, becomes pregnant. There's also this mini controversy because was she pregnant between the two guys? Mm. But because of the rating board was so strict back then, they had to make it look like. I can't specifically remember. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, I didn't know Ginger Rogers. You think of her as song and dance lady who's yeah. dancing backwards to everything Fred Astaire's doing, right? It's the big, mm -hmm. you know, it's the big uh, joke. She did everything he did, but backwards and in heels, you know? <laughs> right. Have you ever heard that before? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, but the performance is multi dimensional. It, she goes from one to the next emotion. She's very strong-willed um, without giving too much away because it is definitely something that you should see. Maybe not with Steph because mm -hmm. what happens in the movie is, well, it's a movie with conflicts, of course, sure. but the things that she has to endure, endure are intense. Mm -hmm. And you come out and you go, <laughs> Ginger Rogers really can act. I don't know why I have a hang up about that, I guess, because you just seen her in these movies dancing around. You don't think of her as something of substance, but this role, if you ever get a chance, check it out. It's worth watching. Well, that's great. And it looks like she beat Betty Davis, yeah. Joan Fontaine, and Katherine Hepburn. Yeah, I was looking at that. I was, And there's, I was reading online that a lot of people were like, oh, Katherine Hepburn should have won because of this and blah, blah, blah. Story, yeah. yeah, and right, exactly. And this is the reason why, but 
I'm completely against everybody. The right person won. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So if you ever get a chance, check it out. It's one of those movies where it goes beyond its time frame. You know, it's mm-hmm. not stuck in that black and white era where you can't get into it because it's so melodramatic. Mm-hmm. She definitely grounds it. She's a realistic character. She can walk off the screen. You know, enough said. But if you do get a chance, watch this movie. All right. All right. Well, I mean, I don't have anything for a while. So what's, what's, what's your next one? I mean, as far as like chronologically, I, I've been, I mean, I saw Double Indemnity. That was in 1944. Barbara Stanwyck was was uh, nominated, but... But it's, didn't win. No, it didn't win. Ingrid Bergman won that year. For what? Anastasia? No, for Gaslight. Yeah, I've seen that. Uh, and I watched it on purpose because I wanted to see her Oscar win. And the movie is very cliche, melodramatic, black and white film. Everything's a bit over the top. She's great. Mm-hmm. I kept thinking to myself, when I watch older movies, could you make this movie nowadays and just transpose it to nowadays. Well, you couldn't because the movie takes place when Gaslight was their lighting in their houses Mm. in their apartments, Mm -hmm. and her husband is messing with her mind, or at least you think her husband is, or you're not sure. And the Gaslight flickers on in some rooms and doesn't flicker on. I guess you could use electricity, but there's something about candlelight and Mm -hmm. Gaslight. She's very good. I mean, she has two Oscars, three Oscars, I think, really? two. I think she has two Best Actress and one Best Supporting. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But so you have seen Gaslight or are you not? I have seen, not seen yeah. Gaslight, no. Yeah. Uh-uh. we got to get you caught up with some older I movies. I know. Well, and, and that's the other thing is like, so if they're not, stre- if not, they're not available streaming, a lot of times they're not even available. They're not, they've not been released on DVD. So it's like you got to catch them on turn of classic movies or something yeah you know i mean some of them i'm sure you know are are available but but yeah i, I do need to get back there and well and during the, them. the 30 days of oscars on uh turner classic movies they mm-hmm. show a lot of these films oh that i've never had, i haven't had cable for the last like five years yeah so me this either is the, this is yes. the first year I've well had cable, welcome so. to 30 days of oscars you're gonna love it because oh, they great. show all that stuff yeah they do and that's well, the 30 days leading up to the oscars yes okay. exactly well um so since you're kind of more up to date i'm gonna go over a few older ones or uh, long time ago ones, Jane Weidman. Do you know who she is? She's I've heard of her. Yeah. She's in a movie called Johnny Belinda where mm-hmm. she plays a, a mute lady who has a bad experience and ends up pregnant and it's mesmerizingly great. She's great. It's one of the Oscar wins for not for a non-speaking role. I believe Holly Hunter for the piano is another one and mm-hmm. there's been a couple more um, I can't Marley think of Marley Matlin. Did she actually speak? Well, she does speak, but that technically qualifies. She uses a couple of um, words here and there. Mm-hmm. And I guess uh, Holly Hunter does have um, voiceovers. So that I don't know if that counts, mm-hmm. but she never speaks as the character. Mm-hmm. But neither does Jane Weinman. Another one. It, it's one of those ones that you hear about and you think, both Kitty Foyle and Johnny Belinda are subjects you think, wow, these were movies back then. Movies weren't as tight and conservative as everybody gives them yeah. this image to be. Both of these movies, I'm sitting here saying like, wait, what? This was yeah. back in 1940, 1946? Yeah, exactly. Like we talked about From Here to Eternity, yeah. what that movie is really about. Mm-hmm. It, you know, the big love scene on the beach. It's crazy because of who they are in the movie. Yep. And when you watch it, you're, oh, wow, these are why they've stood the test of time. Because mm-hmm. they're about true subject matter. They're about true human conditions. They're not just the surface. Yeah. 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 And what happens to her and Johnny Belinda is, it's devastating and it's sad. She holds it in and she never says a word. And some people say that might be a little bit easier. That might be a little bit harder. I'm not really sure. I obviously have the gift of gab. So mm-hmm. I've never had a character where I didn't speak. I've had characters where I've not spoken a long time. Mm-hmm. And that's been interesting. But I find it easier to have an actual word to speak from me. And then Judy Holiday from Born Yesterday. Have you seen that one? Mm-mm. Okay, the reason why she's on this list for me is she plays the ditzy kind of uh, showgirl, but she's not the showgirl. She's uh, hooked up with this mobster guy, and she is 
introduced to another guy who is going to help her become smarter. And by becoming smarter, she learns that this mobster guy has not been treating her right. And she has the kind of high-pitched voice where Mm -hmm. it kind of sounds like she's airheadish. And it's interesting because a lot of times we talk about these Oscar performances and they have all these multi-dimensions. They cry, they laugh, they scream, they yell, they, they, you know, have these intense scenes or they have these sad scenes. This one is pretty just even-toned kind of airheaded ditzy but once she really realizes what's going on she uses that to her advantage and the other reason why this is on it it's a fun watch this one watch with Steph she'll get a kick out of this one cool. but she won the Tony for the same play she won the Oscar for which I wow. which I always find interesting yeah hmm. all right we're starting to get into my area okay how about Aud- Audrey Hepburn for Roman Holiday yes, she's okay. on my list okay well that's good that's a good start yeah yeah, I mean, I I enjoyed that movie, um, and I, and I do like Audrey Hepburn. I mean, I've seen her in a few movies, uh, Roman Holiday and Breakfast at Tiffany's, and I'm trying to think. Did you see Wait Until Dark? No, and I also want to see. Uh, uh, is it Funny Girl or is that the no, that's Barbara that's Streisand. Streisand? What's the other one that's like uh, something girl? I thought Funny Face. That's what it is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. she has like some famous like dancing type thing i don't know but funny face that's that's another one um and then i haven't i love grace kelly and i haven't seen the the movie that she won the academy award for the country girl i have i liked it i liked her i can watch her all day yeah she and she's playing i don't know what 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 the term would be i've used this before dumbed down I, i don't i don't think that's a good term to use but she's not playing the beautiful blonde in this. She's mm-hmm. playing the supportive wife of an alco- alcoholic actor, Ben Crosby, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And she's she's the solid character in it. She's not the she doesn't have the big scenes or anything like that. But yeah, it's worth watching. It's def- and that was an interesting year because that's the year that Judy Garland supposedly should have won for stars born Mm -hmm. and i i have openly said i i think grace kelly should have won i think judy garland should have won for the judgment at nuremberg Mm -hmm. but she couldn't have because rita morano won for west side story so yeah forget (laughs) about it right there it's not gonna work yeah exactly but audrey hepburn in roman holiday that's her first movie really that's her first movie wow and she is just spectacular in that she's charming sophisticated naive willing she's goofy but yet princess like because that's what she is Mm -hmm. there's that scene at the end where she has to act like she doesn't really know um uh gregory peck gregory peck i want to say carrie grant that's 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 top notch acting right there it's one of those ones that you watch and you go oh she should have won the oscar she did yeah that's great um, Ingrid Bergman, you're right, did win for Anastasia also. So that's two. Right. And then she, she has um, a supporting actress Oscar for Murder on the Orient Express, Express. I believe. Oh, okay. I think she's the three-time winner. All right. Um, and then the next one that I've got is, as far as winners are concerned, it's it's a ways down, uh, is, is Julie Andrews from Mary Poppins. That's... I, that's the only one that I've seen. In, what year in all is that? Of these sixty-three. That's, or sorry, sixty-four. That's not true. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, because we're gonna skip um, sixty-four. Uh, I I saw sixty-four. Is yes. Is Mary, is Pop- Mary Poppins? Okay. So explain this to me. Why did she win the Oscar for this? I don't know, but I mean, of of all the movies that are there, that's the only one that I've seen. So okay. So that's the only one I could com- could actually talk about. What? <laughs> What, obviously, I don't have a problem with this subject, but what is it about that role that won her an Oscar? Because I've seen it. Is there is there a particular scene you think that she's super in and she's great in? She's consistent as the character, and it's. Do you a, think that movie kind of like lived a little bit higher than other movies in that year because of the marriage of of live action and animation? Maybe. But I, I I just recently watched it again, and I didn't get all the way through it, so I can't say this for, you know, complete fact for me. But there's, no, I think she's great, but mm-hmm. there's, 
you know, I liked her better in The Sound of Music. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think she won for that one, did no, she? No, she yeah. didn't win. As uh, crazy enough, I believe that it goes something like this. Sound of Music was Julie Andrews, but... No, 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 no. Mary Poppins year. Was uh, Audrey Hepburn nom- nominated for My Fair Lady? Um, Sound of Sound of Music was the the next year. Okay, it was after Mary Poppins. So and then uh, who was nominated? Debbie Reynolds for Unsinkable Molly Brown, Anne Bancroft for The Pumpkin Eater, Sophia Loren for Marriage Italian Style, and Kim Stanley for Seance on a Wet Afternoon. And that's Mary Poppins year. That's Mary Poppins. Year. Okay, so then the next year for Sound of Music, that was Julie Christie won for Darling. Okay, yeah. And then you've got uh, other people who I've never heard of. Uh, Simone Signoret, Elizabeth Hartman, and Samantha Egger. Oh, okay. No, I thought there was some kind of strange symmetry there because Mary uh, Julie Andrews was originally supposed to be was in the original show My Fair Lady on Broadway, but then they cast Audrey Hepburn. Yep. And then overdubbed her voice, and that caused a big controversy. What part of her voice did they overdub? All of it. The, the singing voice. Oh, the singing voice, yeah. but not her speaking voice. No, not, okay. her vo- right. not her speaking voice. No, 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 no. It's not a completely dubbed performance, just okay. her, her vocals. She originally sang, but they took it out. Oh, jeez. No, it wasn't bad. You can hear it. They actually have it. You can probably YouTube it at this oh, point. Okay. It wasn't bad. No, it wasn't that it was bad. Huh. It just wasn't the quality that they were looking for. Gotcha. Um, but anyway, so there's some kind of weird sy- symmetry with uh, the year something with Julie Andrews winning. I can't remember, but... wow. But yeah, I've, I, I watch Mary Poppins, and I think it's fun, and I like it, and I enjoy it, and I think she's great, but you know, what made her stick out as the Oscar winner? Maybe she was just the popular vote. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Could be. So uh, the year before that, in 63, Patricia Neal won for HUD. I haven't seen HUD. I like Paul Newman. Is it? Is that a, Have you seen it? Yes, I have. Um, and this is one of those ones where, is she the lead actress? She's definitely the female lead, if you will. She's the only female, really, of prominence in this movie. Mm -hmm. But is she the lead? I'm not so sure about that. Is she a standout? Yeah, I've seen her in other things. I I thought she was more interesting. Apparently, she got sick or got into a car accident. One of the two, I can't remember. And uh, that's the reason why they think she won was because of sympathy vote. Well, that happened with Elizabeth Taylor, uh, for her first Oscar. Butterfield 8? Yeah, she was in the hospital dying, and that's the reason why they think they gave it to her. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it happens, you know. Do you think Heath Ledger won because of that also? No. Okay. No, remember we talked about this. I know, but I just, I mean, in, no. in general, you kind of have to bring up things like that, those posthumous, I mean, are they giving it to him for, you know, for no reason? But Okay, it's... Is this based on my seeing the performance? Then I would have to say I can see why somebody would say that about Elizabeth Taylor's performance in Butterfield 8. I can see why somebody would say that about Patricia Neal's performance in HUD. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to Heath Ledger's performance, the performance is on the screen. It's Oscar-worthy and Oscar-deserving on the screen. The other two, I can kind of see why Mm -hmm. that would have crept in and influenced somebody to vote for them you know, because the performances, I like them in both those two movies, Butterfield 8 and HUD, but it's not anything that would have struck me as, oh, this should have won the Oscar, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Well, and I think that the big, the biggest thing that, that Dark Knight had going against it was that it was a comic book movie. Yeah, which I think is a shame. I think yeah. that's sad that we can't step out of the fact, we talked about this with comedies, that they can't see Bridesmaids as a Best Picture nominee. nominee. That's mm-hmm. it. All these things change eventually. Well, and it will again. I think both Bridesmaids and Dark Knight were before they went to ten. Up no. to ten. No, Dark Knight is supposedly the figured, reason. The reason why they went back to ten. That's what they said. But Bridesmaids came after that. Bridesmaids came after that. Okay. It was nominated for Best Original Screenplay, which I thought it should have won, uh-huh. and Best Supporting Actress for Melissa McCarthy. But no, Dark Knight uh, was the year before yep. they went to ten. Okay. And they said it was so they could uh, put more sci-fi, more stuff in there. And then the following year or two later, Star Trek came out and District 9 came out. District 9 was nominated, but Star Trek wasn't. Mm-hmm. And people were like, well, wait a second. Star Trek was a really great film. 
District 9 is a really great film. Mm -hmm. What separates the two? You know, I can see why District 9 was nominated. Boy, we can go off into a bunch of different That's categories. Right. Good but we're, Lord. We're, but we're now up to 1966, which is Elizabeth Taylor from yes. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which I can talk about now, and we have talked about it. Um, and I do think that, I mean, I haven't seen all, you know, any of the other movies on this list, but I can definitely see how she won the Academy Award. Okay, so let's use this as the example. If somebody had said she was dying in the hospital and that's the reason why she won that Oscar, you can now say, oh, I don't think so. That performance mm -hmm. is right there. It's on the screen. Yeah. It's on. It's right there. She is intense. She became that character. The character became her, whatever the debate is. Mm -hmm. She gained all that weight, which people say is, you know, I could gain weight and lose weight all day long. It's not the point. The point is she committed to that mm -hmm. as in Hollywood where image is everything. You know, she committed to that smoking, drinking. I thought I, I would not want to be around her mm -mm. filming that movie. I would not want to be around them together. No. Oof. Her and Richard Burton. No. And they were married at the time, correct? I can. We talked about this before. I can't remember. I okay. can't, they've been married yeah, so many look. time off and on that it, it's hard to say. But yeah, that's a that's a Best Actress Academy Award winning performance for a reason. Mm -hmm. And the next year is just, I mean, at least for me, it seems like it would have been a, an amazing year to, to go to the movies. 1967, ha, you had Catherine Hepburn won for Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which I have seen. Um, and then she was up against Anne Bancroft for The Graduate and Faye Dunaway for Bonnie and Clyde, Audrey Hepburn for Wait Until Dark, which I haven't seen, and then Edith Evans for The Whisperers. But, I mean, that year, oh my gosh. Outstanding. I couldn't imagine that. I mean, that's kind of up there. We've talked a little bit about 1999 and a little bit maybe about 2007 too uh, also because those those years you can just start rattling off movies that came out those years and like i mean i wasn't necessarily going to the movies all the time in 1999 not because i was just out of high school but um i mean 2007 like i saw a bunch of those movies that came out in 2007 that were great i mean there will be blood uh you know and no country for old men all of these movies um but but it sounds like that year was just amazing and kind of like the the beginning of, um, I've been on and off reading this book called Raging Bulls and Easy Riders. And um, it's talking about this period of time in filmmaking. And it kind of starts with, uh, you know, Easy Rider and, and move, moves up to, to Raging Bull. But, but right after Easy Rider, you start getting the graduate bonding. You start getting these kinds of like, you know, uh, Warren Beatty pushing to make this movie Bonnie and Clyde and uh, Mike Nichols moving into, I mean, with Virginia Woolf the next year he did the graduate. Yeah, I mean, that's he's crazy. Just, and he was probably also doing plays too. I don't know, you know, directing plays too. I'm not sure, but you have seen Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. How yeah. do you feel about that movie? So it, it's, it's, a, I think it's a statement on celebrity. It's a statement on, how we deal with celebrity and how they dealt with celebrity even back then in, in their time. Um, and it, it is just as valid today as it was back then. There's just different ways of, there's different ways to become a celebrity and there's different things that were completely, that are completely acceptable to us. I mean, Jesse James was a celebrity. Right, exactly. I mean, and he killed people. I mean, right. so they I wrote mean, books. Yeah. Remember an unforgiven when he, uh, George, I seen oh, okay, okay, okay. Gene Hackman says, yeah. no, okay. Yeah. I need to see it. Yeah, okay. But they had books about yeah. Jesse James? Absolutely. Well, different uh, criminals and different events, and some events are brought up that the Gene Hackman character's like, uh, yeah, I was there. That didn't happen like that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting when people say, back in the day, this would have never happened. And I go, yeah, it's always happened. We just have faster information to get it out there. More people are giving more stories about their life. All this stuff has happened for decades. Yeah, and arcs are just shorter. Yeah. I mean, people are famous less. Yeah. I mean, for a less, a less amount of time. Absolutely. And there's more people that are famous. That's basically it. And a lot of these people do horrible things and are famous for doing those horrible things. Natural born killers. Yeah, that's another comment. Yeah, they yeah. were like, that's exaggerated. I'm like, no, it's not. That's... We get obsessed with those. Look at those trials that, 
you know, the mother who killed or drowned her kids and all these people all, all the way to OJ and mm-hmm. before OJ. And the how, Menendez brothers yeah, and all that stuff. Yeah, all that stuff. It's always been that way. That It's just faster now. You can just comment on it now. Before you just read it in the paper or somebody told you by passing through the town back then. So, yeah, I think Bonnie and Clyde is interesting and holds up to this day. I also think it's really good filmmaking, too. Yes. It's really good storytelling. It's really great casting. Mm-hmm. All of them were nominated. And Estelle Parsons, uh, Gene Hackman's uh, wife, mm-hmm. won the Oscar. Yeah, and you've got like little, you know, little inserts. I mean, Gene Wilder was yeah. amazing in that movie yes, he for was. the one scene that he was in it. Do you remember the scene with Estelle Parson where she's blindfolded and they're messing with her? I don't remember. The next one. time you watch the movie, okay. it'll stick out to you. It's, it's Somebody said to her, whispered into her ear when she got done with uh, filming that day, they said, you're going to win the Oscar. And she was like, yeah, okay, whatever. But she did. She oh, did. That's cool. Um, so, so that was the year that, uh, that Catherine Hepburn won for Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Did Spencer Tracy win too? Or? No, okay. he was nominated and the two supporting characters were nominated to Poitier and no Poitier's uh, parents. Oh, okay. um, I don't think, I don't think Sidney Poitier was nominated. I don't okay. think he was, uh, she won Catherine Hepburn. Have you seen that movie? Mm-hmm. Yeah. She deserved to win. She has four. She has four Best Actress Oscars. She's the only one in Oscar history so far. There are other people who have four Oscars or other people who... No, other people have four Oscars but not actresses. No, 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 that's not true. She's the only one who has four Best Actress. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who have nominations and possible wins, but Meryl Streep has two, but... Uh, or has three, one's a supporting actress Oscar. She's the only one in Oscar history who has four, and I think all four of them are intense roles and I think this is one of them. She's she's really great and guess who's coming to dinner. When she has that conversation with Spencer Tracy at closer to the end of the film saying, wait a second, what if we were the other people in this situation? What if we were Sidney Poitier's parents? Mm-hmm. How would you feel? And let's admit to what we're really thinking here. She says it and he's like, you know, you're right. And he basically has that great speech at the end, but it's pretty much just what she said a little longer winded Mm -hmm. and so i thought it was interesting how he expanded upon what she had already said in one or two little lines in a scene she's outstanding in that Mm -hmm. i i I wouldn't take it away from her definitely and the next year she won again and tied with barbara streisand that's what makes this interesting how does that work it's the only tie in oscar history that is an actual voted tie Apparently, back in the day, not apparently, back in the day, they used to add 29 and 30 year together. Years 29 and 30 would be combined together. It's weird. If you look back in uh, from 29 to about 36, I guess it is, or mm-hmm. 39, there was also two nominations in one year was considered one nomination. You have to read about it. It's a strange little breakdown. If you go to Wikipedia, yeah, it's they get got 29 and 30 were yeah, together. Yeah. 30 and 31 were together. And, uh, back then you could write stuff in and oh. Betty Davis was written in for best actress. I think it's the last time that they allowed that, but mm-hmm. this is an honest to goodness tie Barbara Streisand and Catherine Hepburn. And it's interesting because Catherine Hepburn had already won three others this mm-hmm. is no two, two others. others right this is her third and this is barbara strassan's first nomination and i think both performances are deserving of the oscar and i'm glad and can you imagine there might be like this slight little oh i wish i'd won it by myself but how could you ever say that when it's katherine hepburn exactly. that you tied that with sharing i'm with. good and it's not like you get a half a statue. Yeah, you get no, the whole statue. Right. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I tied with her, you know. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, who's next on your list? Uh, I'm not sure what year it is, but it's Jane Fonda from Clute. 1971, yeah. Have you seen that movie? Nope. Okay, it's one of those performances where I've heard about it. She plays a prostitute. And I'm, you know, a little bit of eye rolling starts to happen where, oh, a prostitute. Because, you know, the whore with the heart of gold is a stock character mm-hmm. and has been since the Greeks. Okay, it just is. The everyday guy, the everyman, the whore with the heart of gold, the, the, um, the lovers, the young princess lover, they're all stock characters. This is a stock character. And I'm thinking, what is it about this movie that made her win an Oscar? Then I watched it. And it's 
basically a murder mystery. Donald Sutherland is a detective. She's involved with the underworld that has something to do with this murder. And so he enlists her to get him into the world. Mm -hmm. And she's also a, a drug addict too. And there is a scene where she's at a club and she's lit up on whatever drugs that she's doing. And she's sitting in the corner and he sees her and she sees him from across the room. And she kind of, you have to see it because she gives this look like, oh, screw it. I'm on drugs. I don't care about you. And then when he gets closer to her, she starts to feel the ramifications of what she's done and what she's doing in her life. And her face reads every ounce of those emotions that probably is written on the page mm -hmm. and you think wow Jane Fonda has caused a lot of stir in her life only because of uh, her father or not only because of her father and her brother mm -hmm. but the whole Vietnam War thing she's caused a big stir everybody's got a bad taste in her mouth but I'm telling you when you see this movie you go yes she should have won the Oscar do you have the list of who was nominated that year yeah uh, it was uh, Julie Christie for McCabe and Mr. Miller uh, Glenda Jackson from Sunday Bloody Sunday, Vanessa Redgrave, Mary Queen of Scots, Jane Suzman, Nicholas, and Ann Alexandra. Yeah, I have to say I've only seen two of those th uh, five, but I'm telling you, this movie, it, it, Jane Fonda deserved it. It's another one if you get a chance not to watch with Steph, but <laughs> to get okay. a chance to check out. Well, cool. And then um, the next year, Liza Minnelli for Cabaret. Yeah. We've we've kind of talked a little bit about this, I think maybe even off the off the podcast, but uh, but yeah, I mean that's oh we talked about it with when Joel, we Gray. About Joel Gray, yeah. yeah. So I mean, these are definitely movies that if you love films, these movies, these people, it's evidence that the Oscars is not just about publicity and business. Mm -hmm. It actually has gone. The, the award went to somebody who, when you watch the movie, you go, I am glad I have seen this movie. I mean, not necessarily it's going to lift you up and, you know, give you a good feeling about your life. These movies are hard movies to watch. But these are not performances from movie stars and they just decided to give them an accolade because they're famous. These are ingrained, intense, emotional dramatic performances and I think Liza Minnelli's is up there too and it's almost she almost plays the ditzy showgirl in that but she has a couple of scenes that you go wow she's really intense that's great all right um my next one's Louise Fletcher for One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest no I have some issues with this I do one. too okay go and, ahead and it's the one I she's not on my list of like top but right. she's on my list of let's talk about it because I've actually seen that one <laughs> so to me, I didn't see. I mean, I I could see Jack Nicholson. I could see, um, you know, the, di didn't the screenplay get nominated? Or? Um, it won. It's one of the ones that have all five of the Oscars. Okay. Best actor, best actress, best director, best screenplay, and best picture. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I can see the screenplay. I can see the director. Um, I mean, there wasn't anything to me that 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 you know said, "Oh my gosh, Mila Foreman is a genius," but. Uh, I mean, it, it was fine to, for for me, and then I could see Jack Nicholson. But then, similarly for the, uh, Louise Fletcher's role as Nurse Rat, I always thought it was Nurse Ratchet. Yeah, but it's Nurse Ratched, is what it Rat says in here. Yes, Mildred Ratched, like wretched. I don't know. But uh, anyway, I I don't see. I don't know. There were less and less times when I think about that movie because I haven't seen it for years and my mind doesn't automatically go to her it goes to other scenes you know it goes to the basketball scene outside or him walking into the the, the world the series it's the world series yeah yeah him walking into the hospital initially you know or you know just and obviously the the, the chief you know at the end um it, it, all of that None of that has to do with, with Nurse Ratchet. And I know there are certain scenes in there where she's the antagonist and she's the person to root against or whatever, you know, the person to rail against. But but no, there was nothing that was, you know, extraordinary to me about that, that performance. The performance, I think, has definite Oscar caliber moments. The scene where the young uh, guy with the curly hair, he's... 
semi-famous, and I can't think of his name. He was in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He's he's always just a. I always want to say Crispin Glover, but it's not Crispin Glover. I cannot think of his okay. name. He was nominated for the Oscar that year for Best Supporting Actor. He has the uh, affair, or not the affair. He has the Brad Dourif. Oh, that's okay. him. Yes, he has the huh. one night stand with the girl. And she gives him a lot of guilt about that. What would your mother say about that? That scene's excellent. She's excellent. My issue with her is, is she the lead character in the movie? Sometimes I think people get confused about the lead character versus the only female character of prominence in the movie. Could you do that movie without her? My answer ends up being yes. Mm -hmm. She does stand out. She did a great job. I, I, I think moment to moment, it's really good work. She scares me. I don't want her to show up when she shows up. I don't want to deal with her. The whole way she just has to say, it's time to take your medicine. It's the, that whole kind of nondescript tone she has in her voice that even though she's sounding menacing, but she's also sounding clinical at the same time. Hard to pull off. I get the acting achievement. Mm -hmm. But for me, she's the supporting character in that role, in that movie. So mm -hmm. that's my only issue is that technically for me, she's the supporting character. But if she was in the supporting actress category that year, would she have won for me? Yes, she should have won for me. So. Do you, yeah, because I mean, when you look at the other uh, uh, nominations, I haven't heard of half of these movies. I've heard of Tommy and Margaret was... Nominated for That's Tommy. That's a weird nomination. It's a weird nomination, I would think, because isn't it like a opera, basically, it's a, a rock musical. opera? Yeah, yeah, it's a rock. Yeah, it's rock opera. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. And she's really weird. It's a strange movie. <laughs> it's really weird, dude. Champagne it. and uh, baked beans. She dances and sings and swims in. I'll just leave it at that. Oh yeah, it's very strange. Uh, the other one was Isabel Adjani for the story of Adele H. Uh, Glenda Jackson for Hedda and Carol Kane, who I've heard of for hester street yeah see i so maybe it was a weak year in yeah quotes it could be yeah it could be type of a thing i guess or a momentum for the movie mm -hmm. like i said i'm not taking anything away from louise fletcher i think she's great in the movie but for me like i said yeah. she's in the wrong category and then the next year is 1976 Faye dunaway for network um which i mean that year looks like it was a, an interesting year Talia Shire was was nominated for Rocky. I mean, do you f feel like I guess, has she gotten kind of like dissed for that movie or no? And I think she should have been nominated. I don't know why people even people bring that up. Like they're surprised about that that she she never really had this big career per se. But I believe she was nominated for The Godfather mm -hmm. also. For Is the it because of her relationship with? Uh, she's. Excellent in Rocky, and I don't care what anybody says. All they have yeah. to do is watch the third Godfather movie and then watch Rocky. That is not the same person. She, there's nothing. She's sweet and kind and almost dim-witted in Rocky, mm -hmm. but yet she's the smartest one in the room when they're all together. Yeah. She's sensible, but she wants to be loved, but she's afraid of being loved because she's not a looker. She's not a physically attractive woman by societal standards although you can see why he's charmed by her mm -hmm. all of that's in her performance i'm fine with her being nominated i think it's a good nomination mm -hmm. who else that year sissy spacek for carrie which i've seen yeah good and i mean yeah you you've got sissy i mean those two right there uh liv allman i've heard of as an actress i know wasn't she in uh i think she was in uh yeah she was in seventh seal I think she's the Ingmar Bergman. She's done a lot of Ingmar Bergman movies. Isn't she also the lady who was just in uh, the black and white film we watched for something old, something new, something boring and something blue. Um, what was the, Oh, I know you're, you're talking about night of the hunter. Yeah. Isn't she the, she was in night of the that's hunter. not the woman. That's not the older woman who takes care of the kids. Oh no, that was um you're thinking of the uh Wow, reference night. It is reference night. Yeah. You're thinking uh, I have she's a headache. A, I don't know a, what your deal well, is. Well she's a she's a silent <laughs> actress and I'll have to look it up, but uh uh Lillian Gish. Thank you. That's okay. what you think of. Didn't Liv look it up. L, yeah. <laughs> I didn't look it up. Good I pulled you. it out. You okay. did. Good for you. But uh I would have never gotten that tonight. <laughs> But anyway, so the, those are those are the the nominees uh, going up against Faye Dunaway, and I mean, she was a commanding, 
presence on screen and seeing somebody. I think that, so I, I work at a TV station and uh, I can imagine back then, especially you're, you're in the mid seventies and TV has been around for 25 years, 30 years, almost well, probably 20, 20 years. And it's been dominated by men. And so you see this person kind of come in here and take charge, whether it's, I mean, in anything like that, in, in any kind of, uh, you know, uh, newspapers or television or anything like that, I can see how that was a, you know, breath of fresh air or kind of a, kind of a saying like women can do this too type thing, an empowering performance. Like I could see that. You know? Well, a lot and, of and the, the, the way it's sorry. And the way that That's she right. is willing to, to, to do the things that you wouldn't think, a, a caring, you know, woman would do, you know, she's like, no, no, we're going to put it out there. We're going to, this is what people want to see. We're going to, we're going to let them see it. Warts and all type of a thing. Well, she's ruthless. Yeah. And she's non-sympathetic. She's a, she has no vulnerability. You feel no sympathy towards her. Actually, it's interesting because Louise Fletcher sort of the same way. And a lot of people give the Oscars grief because they say it's a popular vote and all this other stuff. And that's mm-hmm. why Sandra Bullock won for The Blind Side over Gabrielle Gabri- Sidibe for Precious. These two right here prove that that is not the truth. These two performances right here, unsympathetic, ruthless focused women who are going to get exactly what they want the way that they want it. Mm-hmm. So she, Faye Dunaway stays solid. She could have wavered. She could have tried to give out a sympathetic tone in some scenes. She's not. She's not even nice to William Holden, who she's having an affair with. Yeah. She's ruthless. She's like, if you're not here at this time, then so bad. You know, I, I won't think twice about it. Yeah. She basically says to him, oh, well, okay, next. <laughs> yeah, she's ruthless. Yep, you got Annie Hall the next year, Diane Keaton um, against Jane Fonda again, Shirley MacLaine and Anne, Anne Bancroft. Did Anne Bancroft not win? She didn't win anything. She won for The Miracle Worker. Oh, okay, that's yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, she's, she's got quite a few nominations, nominations, and she's won too. Oh, great. All right, is there anything else you wanted? Is there anything you want to talk about? My next one is Meryl Streep for Sophie's Choice. Okay. Which you have not seen. I have not seen. Um, I've seen Officer and a Gentleman, and I thought Deborah Winger was, was good. That's a good year, too. This is a good year, too. But this is one of those movies, like Citizen Kane, that you've heard about. It's quoted, they talk about it, they reference it. It's in the lexicon. Absolutely. And when that moment does happen, that gives the movie its title, you will be flabbergasted. You're like, whoa, what? This, no, 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 no. And then you're mad at yourself <laughs> that you even had to watch it, first of all, and that you doubted the infamy of this performance. And it's not just one scene, though. She... She has a solid character. She's Meryl Streep. Mm-hmm. The, enough said right there, period. Yep. But this one is definitely one you don't want to see with Steph without a shadow of a doubt. I don't think I want to see it with myself. <laughs> yeah, I no, I think you should see it because okay. that moment, this movie, it's important, especially if you love movies. Mm-hmm. You have to know this reference because it's referred to so many times. And then people will make reference to it as a joke, like trying to choose between bubblegum and popcorn. Oh, it's my Sophie's Choice. Trust me, that's not a funny joke. Don't do that. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, don't do that. Um, all right. Uh, did you want to talk about anybody else that, uh, that decade? Cher and Moonstruck. Well, I just Cher saw is, it. Yeah, yeah, Cher's my next... Uh, on my list because a lot of people want they they somebody did a poll online or somewhere where they want, said these people should give their Oscars back mm-hmm. that they didn't really deserve it and Cher is always on top of the list and I disagree with that it was a great year but mm-hmm. out of the people that were nominated other than Holly Hunter for broadcast and news that's the only one I mean I've got a, a short list of ones that I feel like were missed Oscar wins and it has nothing to do with Cher necessarily being you know I don't I'm not saying that she didn't deserve the Academy Award I just feel like what Holly Hunter had to go through and show on screen in broadcast news was to me I mean it's good that she got nominated but I 
feel like she, you know. No, I see that. I get what you're saying. Should have won. I guess. Yeah, when she hangs up the phone at the very beginning and bursts oh out in tears. Gosh. Yeah, you've yeah. That she's so shocking. You don't even know what's happening. Yeah, no, when she does that, and you're like, wait, is she laughing? Okay, she's not laughing. No, she's not. But the thing about it is, is that one share did win. And is it a performance, in my opinion, worthy of an Oscar? And I have to end up saying yes. You yeah. said to me after you saw it, you had to look up to see whether or not she was from Brooklyn originally. Yeah, I did. That's a compliment right there. Yeah. And we talked about that opening scene where she gets the flowers, and uh, he says, the flower delivery guy says something like, um, well, you know, I'm not going to give them to you or whatever he says. And she's like, well, I like flowers because she's considered such a businesswoman and almost uh, uh, an old maid kind an of. An old maid. The way she wears her hair. Yeah. She's got like gray streaks in it. Right. And, she's a very strong-willed woman. She's almost gives off a masculine quality in mm-hmm. a time when that was not okay to a degree. And then she has that great moment we talked about where, I mean, she has couple of really great moments. But the moment that sticks out for me is when Nicolas Cage walks her to his apartment and it's really cold outside. And she's like, this is your apartment. What are you doing? And he was like, you need to come inside. And she can't decide what to do because basically she's cheating on her fiance with his brother. His brother, yeah. And instead of going through this whole long scene of I can't do this, she's like, I'm cold. And I feel so bad for her when she say that. I have such sympathy for her. So I would not take it away from him. The list is strong that year. That's what yeah. the issue is, isn't that? Glenn Close from Fiddle Attraction. And Ironweed for Meryl Streep. Which Street. I haven't seen. Yeah. yeah, and Sally Kirkland for Anna. Yeah. All great performances. If I had a vote, I would have voted for Cher. All right. There you go. Um, do you want to talk any, about any of these other ones? My next one's Kathy Bates from Misery. Yeah, interesting, because I'm watching Coven, which is which American. Which Kathy yeah, Bates. Yeah, which she just won the Emmy for, and deservedly so. Uh, I, uh, I think I have one more episode left, and she is a standout in this, too. Is she in all of them? All no, the, this is uh, the first one that she was in. So she's in three and four? Yes, three okay. and four, yes. The Coven, which is last season, and then a uh, Freak Show, which is this new season, Got which it. is on TV now. It's so interesting how they're doing that how they're I mean how they've kind of moved to kind of a an ensemble cast although and it rotates very, yeah but then it's also it's also open and closed true detective is the same way which you haven't seen yet but you need to see um it where you know they've got it's called true detective and they've got these characters and they're in it for this season and that's it and that's it and well, now there may be some crossover. Maybe Woody Harrelson will talk to some of the main characters from the next season in one scene of one episode. But it's not a, it's not a. We're doing it this season. You know, we're doing this season. You know, we're locked in for five seasons or something like that. Well, interestingly enough, Car goes the same way. Too. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Um, the American Horror Story is nominated for many series, and True Detective was nominated for best show. Huh. Or best drama, I guess. Yeah. So I, there's this weird distinction that I don't quite understand, but they won't do crossovers at all, at all for American Horror Stories because it's okay. a completely different time frame. The second season is Asylum. It takes place in a completely different decade. Okay. The Coven takes place now. Um, I don't know when Freak Show but takes place. It's kind of like a repertory theater. Like, it's kind of yeah. like, you know, it's like, yeah. what are we doing this year? And Jessica Lang is at the lead, and trust me, she should be. Wow. Because she is on point. She has two Oscars. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason. Yep. So, but we're not talking about Jessica Lang right now. We're talking about Kathy, Kathy Bates, Bates from Misery. And she just is that whole movie. I mean, you've got James Caan in there, but you can't take your eyes off of her the whole movie. And she's. She plays a likable, crazy person. I mean, she's a, she's a likable person until you don't do exactly what she wants you to do, and then she's she a likable. Legs. Yeah, she's like. And do you know on her on Oscar night when she won, she publicly apologized for that. She's like, <laughs> I'd like to publicly apologize for the leg thing. Um, <laughs> it's when she talks about the movie. The, the serial movies that she's watching as a kid and the car's going over the cliff and then they come back next week and the car doesn't go over the cliff yeah. and she's like, it doesn't go over the cliff. Then she starts to lose it a little bit and you're like, what is she going on? Here's what I want you to imagine. Imagine those words on the page, the cock and all the cussing mm-hmm. that's not really cussing. Imagine it written out. 
And then imagine trying to read it out loud as if a person says those things. The challenge for me would be how she cussed without really cussing, Mm -hmm. how she spoke in that language. It's almost a whole nother language because she's pretty much a shut-in to a degree. She doesn't have a lot of social interaction. So she's developed her own way of having conversations with herself. And you can tell when she's talking to James Caan, she sounds like she's talking to herself in the mirror or something. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting character. Well, and the other thing is that you could tell that that this this character her whole life kind of thought that this would happen and oh, it she did, knew it was exactly. going to happen exactly yeah. she knew it was going to happen and now it's happening and so she's kind of like prepared herself for this and she's going through this this process and he's in certain at certain times he's not cooperating and that's just not acceptable well the thing <laughs> is is that she's a representation even though she turns out to be an an evil person mm-hmm. or a not completely sane person that's lightly said yeah. that she does make some valid points because in those movies that ended one way and then they started it the next week another way because serial movies were uh the uh, a thing yeah. yeah and she makes a point about a couple of the characters in his books would have never have done that because she's his number one fan so she makes a lot of valid points about how literature and movies and all this stuff can take a, a poetic license with it when mm-hmm. the audience is smarter than you're giving them credit for. That would have never yeah. happened, she says. Well, and look at Star Wars. I mean, look at the culture that has been created by George Lucas creating, by George Lucas making this story and and perpetuating it through the first three movies. And then, I mean, you've got novels, you've got... There's whole books and encyclopedias on all of the different oh, yeah. characters in the universe. And one of those people who've read and seen all that, if he switched something that didn't make sense, they, they would, would know. know it. And so she's making a comment about that, although she goes about it completely the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And I want to say something about James Conn in that film. Without his solid performance, though, she would not be as outstanding as she is because if he was not on point he could have taken it away from her he could have done it in a different direction he could have like gone big with it he could have gone in a different direction and i've rewatched that movie a couple of times and i and i watch it and i think to myself oh well if james Kahn, who else could have played that part who else could have been strong enough for you to believe that he could have been you know dealt with all of that and mm-hmm. still who could have seduced her like he did he yeah. it's a it's a multi-layered part i think it goes unspoken of because of her performance yeah. in a way it's it, it's a it's a tad bit of shame that you know people don't really look at that as great as her performance without his and she's even said that too you know without him being so solid she probably would not have been up there at oscar night but it's a great oscar win mm-hmm. definitely all right, who's your next one? My, I mean, yeah, why don't you go? Cause it's- Mine jumps to Hilary Swank and Boys Don't Cry. Okay, I have Frances McDormand and uh, Fargo. It's not that I, sk- I mm-hmm. skipped her. I, I recognize that she was there, and mm-hmm. I love that performance because, once again, it's not a showy performance. It's mm-hmm. a so- what I call a solid line performance. Mm-hmm. There has no big Oscar moments or anything like that. That's what I like about that character. But you were, you were going to say... She- You're saying it has no, like no scenes that are well when you're watching an oscar peacocky i guess yeah that's a good peacocky we're developing a whole bunch of different languages (laughs) this tonight there's a moment when you're watching a film and you go if they're nominated for the movie this is what they're going to show at the oscars Mm -hmm. when they're nominated this is the scene you know, and it's usually a cry scene or a, a, an anger scene or a laughing scene. It's usually mm-hmm. an, an over the top emotion, not necessarily an over the top, but a large emotion. Mm-hmm. She has no large emotions in that movie. She's yeah. solid. She's a believer. Because the character yeah, exactly. doesn't need it. Yeah, other yeah. than the very end where she starts to. Oh, well, yeah, she yeah. starts breathing heavier. Yeah, when she's she like, what? well, not only that, <laughs> but when she's in the car with him. Yeah. And she's like, I can't figure you out. I can't, you know, she could have done it very judgmentally, but she doesn't. Mm -hmm. She just is perplexed by this guy. What you did, what, to who, in a wood chipper, why? 
Yeah. What? But I think the 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 fact that she has the fact that she's pregnant. So the the physicality of her being pregnant that's one thing. But then the fact that she is pregnant and dealing with these people that she has to deal with by being a, a, a sheriff. It adds a whole other dimension to the character to me where it's not like it's just a person going to work and then they deal with these bad guys and they come home. She's going to work and dealing with these people and having to understand that she's bringing a child into this world that she's going to have to deal with this and her child's going to have to deal with this and what can she do to make the world better specifically for her child, you know, and also for other people too. But there's certain scenes in there that are just the scene where she wakes up really early and her husband played by John Carroll Lynch, who's great, who's great, gets up and he's like, he's like, you need some breakfast. You got to have some breakfast. So they have breakfast and, and then he's sitting there. It's a very well shot. He's still sitting at the table. She goes out, you see her walk out the car, car doesn't start. She comes back in. She says, Prowla needs a jump. I mean, it's, seeing their relationship and how they interact with each other and then juxtaposing that with Steve Buscemi and Peter Stormari and what they go through. And then once they finally get together, you know, seeing how she deals with them and her scene with uh, Mike Yanagita, the guy she meets oh, at the yeah. Radisson. Yeah, 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 yeah. How she deals with that. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I've seen that movie more than I've seen most of these movies on this list. I'll say that right there. So I can drill down on what makes, what what I like about her performance more than I could about, even about, you know, well, I don't want to say, I was going to say even about Virginia Woolf because I've only seen it once, but I pretty much have that committed to memory, I yeah, think. Yeah, that's embedded for the rest of your <laughs> life, dude. It's so, going to come up yeah. when you least expect it to. And and, and because of you, I've seen Hillary, I've seen Hillary Swank and Boys Well, let Don't me Cry. just say one last thing about um, Fargo. The thing that I like the fact that she won the Oscar is the fact that there isn't, I'm, I'm trying to articulate this in a, in a way that will make you make this make sense is that there's always these moments that people go, oh, that's why they won the Oscar. And there's never just a character. I call it the Michael Clayton syndrome. Remember we talked about George Clooney, and Michael Clayton. He really, he's just kind of Atticus Finch and mm-hmm. um, to kill a mockingbird. mockingbird. He's sort of just a real person in a movie that's got moments. He uh, he stays a solid straight line. She does too in Fargo. And it's nice to see it gives credit to the Oscars that they give people who have these performances Oscars because it's not just about a showy dramatic moment or a cry scene or that kind of stuff. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a They're sol- kind of the ground. They're grounded. Yeah, and in they could walk else. off the screen yeah. and completely walk past you in the mall and you wouldn't think twice about them being a person you know, not in real life. It's a fully realized character. It's right. just not a psychotic or character. showy or, you know, that, that kind of thing. I'm yeah. trying to think of somebody over the top who won the performance. Anyway, it, it, the point's been made, but uh, Hillary Swank for boys yeah. don't cry. Yeah. You saw that because I had recommended it. Cause you it. recommended it. Yeah. Yes. It's a hard movie, man. It is a hard movie. And that's another one of those movies that I may not see again, or if I do, it'll have to be, for uh, you know a specific reason or something you know but uh, but there's a bunch of layers to that character to the that the actor has to put on you know she's she's a woman but she's playing a woman who identifies as a man correct who in in his head is a man who has to realize the trappings of that and the limitations of that specifically because i mean especially where he lives where he's at where and time frame too. and the time frame too yeah. and so that's the hard part you know looking at it from hillary swank's you know point of view because that adds a whole nother layer onto it you know that that's the actor having to having to play somebody who's acting a a certain way as opposed to having to play someone who is something else. So in, in their head, you know, well, the thing I find fascinating about it is by the end of the film and I have seen it twice and I believe the second time I saw it was just a happenstance. Maybe somebody else was watching it. So I sat in and watched it again because it's not 
one of those movies, like you said, unless there's a specific reason to rewatch it, mm-hmm. it's not an easy movie to watch for all intents and purposes. The whole ending, the whole scene when she gets arrested and the person in the jails, you know, berating her about who she is mm-hmm. and, and the way she, oh my goodness, how could you not have given her the Oscar just for that one scene? But the reason why I think the, performance is important is because by the end of the film i saw how they saw a man i was convinced i would have been convinced that was a guy Mm -hmm. in real life because at first you're like okay is this going to be like a victor victoria moment with julie andrews do you know that movie she plays a down and out singer who pretends to be a drag queen but pretends to be a male and be a drag queen but not be female she's supposed to be male it's wow yeah it's really it's actually a very fun movie it's Uh it's really well done um james gardner's in it you'd like it it's fun but this one she i was like how is she going to convince me she's a guy because that's what Mm -hmm. she has to do to everybody in her world and then when you see the real person in real life brandon tina that's Mm -hmm. his name right okay I could see how they saw without knowing anything else. It's not like they saw what they wanted to see. This person is a man in their mind's eyes. So that's how they come across. And Mm -hmm. Hilary Swank came across that way. By the end of the film, I was like, yeah, she's a guy. I'm not only convinced that I believe she believes she's a guy. She self identifies as a male, Mm -hmm. but I believe that people would have bought that. I believe people would have, because don't they almost put her into the, the men's jail and then they see her ID or something in the movie. Yeah, And then they see that her name's Tina Brandon instead of Brandon. Yeah. And then they put her in the appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a great performance. It is. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, definitely worth the Oscar. And she was going up against Meryl Streep, Julianne Moore, Annette Bening, and then Janet McTeer, who I, I don't know who I've seen is. all of those performances. Tumbleweeds? Yes. Okay, all right. All of them are great. Wow. Um, all right, what, what's your next one? Uh, Julia Roberts and Aaron Brockovich. Here's, okay. here's why. It, it's definitely the popular vote that year, mm-hmm. and that's fine. But it's one of those movies, well, it's Steven Sonnenberg, first of all, so I find the film interesting to look at just in general, the way it's shot. It's really an interesting film. It gives off a tone and an attitude and a vibration that most of his films do that too. And it's grounded by this really strong performance that a lot of people say have, has more to do with her personality than her performance. Mm-hmm. I personally disagree with that. But it's one of those movies that when it comes on, no matter what part it's on, I continue to watch it if I'm not watching something else, if I'm not getting ready to put in a Netflix or a mm-hmm. Redbox and that kind of stuff. And there's a scene in that movie where I saw the movie and I said, she's going to win the Oscar finally. Have you seen this movie? No. Okay. Well, there, there's, it's not anything you can d- be described without having known what happens before and after, but she handles it so beautifully and so it's so well done, and she's a trash-talking woman who wears clothes that are too tight for her. At least that's mm-hmm. what society is saying, and she's very endowed, and she doesn't mind showing it off, and she doesn't mind using those attributes to get what she wants in this world that she's developing in, no mm-hmm. pun intended. <laughs> um, yeah, I just realized what I said when it was coming out. But yeah. it's definitely a movie worth watching because what this person actually did in real life, the actual Aaron Brockovich, what she actually did was pretty incredible. And I believe that Julia Roberts embodies that, but at the same time, she steps beyond her star quality into an actual character role. And it, it's definitely worth watching. And you're a Sonnenberg fan, so I think I, you, yeah, I lo- I do I love think you should Sonnenberg. see it. I need to, and it was one of those that just fell through the cracks, and and it never, I and I've never just, seen, I've never there taken a, the time. A know? lot of great people nominated that year. Laura Linney was nominated for You Can Count on Me, and she's great in that. But for me, it was Julia Roberts' year, and I'm glad she won it. Ellen Burstyn for Requiem for a Dream too. That's another one. Every and Julia Roberts said I thought they were going to give it to her. Yeah. I mean, I was all prepared to not win. I thought for sure. Now. That's a hard movie to watch, yeah. and Ellen Burstyn is not an easy character to watch in that. It's a well-deserved nomination yeah. for me. If she yeah. had won, I would have been okay with it, but it was Julia Roberts' You know, year. I bought that movie for $2. That's how hard it is to sell that movie. 
Really? Yeah. It was it was a long time ago, but it was like in some sort of a bin, and uh, and it had a bunch of extras on it. And well, the extras are great, but it was two dollars. <laughs> I bought uh, Natural Born Killers for two dollars at some point too. Interesting, because those are movies that people don't buy. I mean, it's not. Well, you do know, you think they don't Avengers, buy it because they you know? <laughs> well, do you think they don't buy it because they don't know what it is, or it's probably the combination of both. So let's say you saw Recommend for the Dream, a Dream in the Theater. You probably would never want to see it again. I mean, I've only seen it three times, I think. I've I've seen it twice, and I had to force myself to see it a second time Mm -hmm. because it is rough. Yeah. The scene when he's shooting up and he's infected, it's rough. Mm -mm. And then what is with Jennifer Connelly in that film? The ending is horrible. It's horrible. What she does, it just shows. Imagine her being your mom. No. Hey, look, no. look, mom, look what my eighth grade friend just found. You were in this movie. Uh, I mean, good lord. And nice. I'm not, I'm not judging that. I'm saying that You're she saying as an actress, but yeah, brave. A, That's a brave, performance. a brave performance. And you know, Darren Aronofsky, man, he's he's he pushes the envelope. And yeah. Jared Leto too. Yeah. He's great in that too. And even Damon Wayans. Yes. Da- no. Uh, uh, Keenan, Marlon Wayans. Marlon Wayans. Marlon right. Wayans. He's great in that too. It's one of those performances where you're not expecting somebody like that to be cast in, Mm-mm. and but he fits perfectly. Yeah. No. It 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 worked. It definitely worked. Uh, what's your next one? Marion Coltier for La Vie en Rose. So I tried to watch that movie and I wasn't invested enough to to stay with it. I think. And this was when she was nominated, and I wanted to like I I didn't see it in the theater, and I put it in. And I just wasn't invested enough to finish it. And maybe it's because I don't know the the history of Edith Piaf and all of that. I mean, I've heard the song. I mean, didn't they use that same song in Inception? That in was like the everything. song that they wake it's up to. It's the song in, in Saving Private Ryan that they're yeah. playing. It's it's in everything. Mm-hmm. Um, no Regret and La Vie en Rose are her two big songs that are in everything. Mm-hmm. But the thing... A lot of people said the same thing you did. The movie's okay. Her performance is outstanding. It's her, her performance. Did that, she sing? No, she doesn't sing. She, so it's Edith Piaf singing. It's Edith Piaf That's singing. Good. There are certain people you can't. Yeah. Yeah. You just can't. Like Angela Bassett uh, didn't sing for Tina Turner. Or La- Billie Holiday, Diana Ross. No, and um, no, she might did have. She, sing? Okay. she might have. Sissy Spacek did sing for Coal Miner's Daughter. Oh, okay. But Jessica Lang did not sing Patsy Cline for Sweet Dreams. Uh-huh. But Sissy Spacek as Loretta Lynn has sort of the same quality the voice. Tone, yeah. Trying to get Tina Turner's voice or Patsy Cline's voice or P- Edith Piaf's voice it's kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's one of those performances though, that I understand that the movie doesn't hold up as well. And maybe it's just because the, the story is not that interesting per se, but she went from playing what 16 years old to playing like 65 years old. Hmm. And she's 20 something mid twenties when she played that. Yeah. Yeah, So it's worth it just for that point. Definitely. Um, And then my next one's Kate Winslet for the reader. Who I didn't put on my list, believe it or well, not. Well, so, so it was, it was weird. I've seen Kate Winslet in a lot of risque movies because she tends to do that, like her and Little Children. <sighs> nominated. Was she nominated? Yes, she was. Okay, I didn't see that. In yeah, there. she was nominated. Oh, yes, yeah, she was nominated. Didn't Her, win. Helen Mirren won that year. Yeah. Wow. Couldn't have touched Hel- Helen Mirren. That, but yeah. that was an interesting year because that year started with Meryl Streep for Devil Wears Prada. Mm-hmm. And everybody's like, oh, she's going to win her next Oscar. Then Judy Dench for Notes on the Scandal. And, oh, she's going to win the Oscar, her second Oscar. And then Helen Mirren came up and people were like, oh, sorry, we'll take it all back. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Uh, but so you see Kate Winslet in Little Children and it makes sense that the, the reader was was a couple of years later so I knew what her capabilities were and she never she pl- I think I thought she played she played it well she didn't make me feel creepy I guess cuz it's basically like her affair with a younger yeah he's boy. like 15 yeah yeah and if it was reverse if that was a guy and a female yeah. a man and a uh, young girl the, mm. it wouldn't have gone across as well no yeah. <laughs> yeah but she didn't make me feel that creepy so uh that year also was uh Anne Hathaway Rachel getting married 
Uh, Melissa Leo in Frozen River, which I never yeah. saw. Now, did, is that something worth seeing? Yes, definitely. That's the first time it, I'd heard of her. But. If not for, well, she was in 21 Grams, which we talked about, I think. And I saw once. Yeah. yeah. I need to see it again. Yeah. So I've, she's always been on my radar, but mm-hmm. I don't think I, oh, that's Melissa Leo. Frozen River gave me her name. Okay. Uh, it's definitely worth watching. It's a great performance. That's a good year. That's a and very Meryl good Street from Doubt, too. Yeah. That's a really hard year. It just happens to be, and I get it, that most people say it's just Kate's year because she's been nominated so many years. I think the performance holds up to the worthiness of the win, but that's that was a difficult year. That mm-hmm. was a really good year. Yeah. And Meryl Streep's been nominated 14 times. 18 times. 18 times? Doesn't it say 18? Also, oh, 15 times is what it says here. Oh, really? But, yeah. So that's, that's oh, extreme. It was, yeah, it is extreme. There's... <laughs> Really, only one out of those that I think is an iffy nomination. The rest, I agree with 100%. Wow. Yeah. That's, re- that's amazing. Yeah. It is. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's her. So, what do you think about Natalie Portman for Black Swan? Once I saw it, there was no doubt in my mind she was going to win. And that's the year Jennifer Lawrence was nominated for Winter's Bone. And I yeah. went, oh, it's such a... And I even said, it's a shame because the next time you're nominated Jennifer Lawrence, you will win the Oscar. And she did for Silver Linings Playbook. Mm -hmm. But Black Swan is one of those movies, yet again, Darren Aronofsky, where it's a well-crafted movie, but it's a well-crafted performance. She made you believe she was a dancer. Mm -hmm. Her she made her body look like a dancer. She lost the appropriate amount of weight, maybe a little too much, depending on how you Look at that. Mm-hmm. The moment when she finds out that she got picked for the role and she calls her mom on the cell phone in the bathroom, the bathroom yep. he picked me, mom. I knew right then and there she was going to win the Oscar. There, She showed the right amount of vulnerability. I thought... There were definitely some vulnerable, vulnerable scenes in that movie. Yeah, human vulnerability, yeah. though. Not necessarily as icky, f- strange ones that Darren Aronofsky puts his characters in. Mm -hmm. I thought the movie might have been a little too strange and off kilter for people. That might have hurt her chances. But who else was nominated that year? Jennifer Lawrence. um, Annette Bening for Kids Are All Right. Nicole Kinman for Rabbit Hole. Which do you think if more people... Because I never saw that movie. Do you think more people saw that movie, it would have... Because it's kind of like one of those Sophie's Choice movies. It's not exactly a Sophie's Choice movie, but... Do you think it was a little melodramatic? I think it was a fill-in-the-blank nomination that they had five nominations. She's great in it, but mm-hmm. would she have stood out for me? If I had seen the movie, would I have said to myself, she's going to be nominated for the Oscar? I'm not so sure. Yeah, and then uh, Michelle Williams, Williams for Blue Valentine. That's another one that I find interesting. because fill-in-the-blank Oscar Not necessarily nomination. that per se, but the if her, why not him? Mm, uh, yeah. I've said that a couple of times. Ryan Gosling is just as great in that movie as she is. And mm-hmm. it's it's a icky relationship movie. And I don't know if I ever want to live in that world again. Mm-hmm. She's as she's have you seen it? No. She's as much of a pain in the ass as he is, but yet he has to bear all of her yelling at him about being a bad father and about being a bad husband and boyfriend and all the stuff and you're like, you're sort of the same way. I mean, it's an interesting performance. Good for her. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, you're going to talk about Jennifer Lawrence of Lang's playbook? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, once again, I did say that, you know, she was my favorite thing. Or, well, my pick that year for Winter's Bone. And the only reason why she didn't win it was because of Natalie Portman. I honestly believe if that was a separate year, Jennifer Lawrence would have won the Oscar mm-hmm. for Winter's Bone. And I did say the next time she's nominated, and this happens to be the next time that she's nominated. And I will say this. It's the first film in 30-some-odd years that were nominated for all four of the acting Oscars. Best Actor, Best Actress, Best Supporting Actor, Best Supporting Actress. And she's the one that won. You're talking about... Bradley Cooper, Robert De Niro, and... uh, Jackie Weaver. Yes, thank you. Had already been nominated herself. Bradley Cooper's first nomination, deservedly so. I believe he would have won if it wasn't for Daniel Day-Lewis being in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Also, De Niro has two Oscars. And then Jennifer Lawrence, who's like 22 at the time. Yeah. And she walks into that room and she says, I've got something to talk to you about. 
to Bradley Cooper when all of that activity is going on after Bradley Cooper gets kicked out of the ball game. Do you remember mm -hmm. in Silver Lang's playbook? And she walks in, completely takes your attention away from everybody else. And De Niro goes, who is this? And she's like, wait a second. Let me tell you something. And she shuts De Niro down. She schools everybody on football, everybody. basically. <laughs> well, all of the statistics about mm -hmm. all the Philadelphia teams that happen to be happen to have lost when she is with Bradley Cooper because Bradley Cooper's dad, Robert De Niro, believes that Bradley Cooper is like his mojo to win, yep. and he's a gambler, and he thinks that he's lost these games because Bradley Cooper wasn't with him. And she points out... <laughs> very vividly that he's completely wrong and goes down the statistics of why he's wrong. And <laughs> she pops open the beer and she goes, I'm Tiffany, by the way, at the end of the speech, I was like, who is this girl? What? <laughs> and I forgotten that she was the one in, in winter's, winter's bone, bone because it's such a drastic, different character. Yeah, there are there. We could do a whole show on that movie alone and her performance alone, because just think about the, uh, the gravity of being the youngest of that cast and being the least experienced too. And yet every time she takes the screen and she's not in the movie for 45 minutes, mm -hmm. once she takes the screen, it's now her movie. She's taken over the movie and I don't think she does it on purpose. I think she just, she has something about her. She, she creates characters that are real and can walk off the screen, but she's also just a tad bit over the top and she's, you know, just a tad bit crazy. Mm -hmm. And she says that to him, Oh, you think I'm crazier than you are. Wait a second. What? And then she manipulates that later on. I can't say enough about that movie. You know how I, I <laughs> yep. love it. I love it. So yep. yes, Jennifer Lawrence, silver linings playbook. All right. Well, I think that's a good way to end it. Absolutely. Right there. All right. Well, if you guys want to check us out on the web, our website is actor and engineer.com. And on Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash actor and engineer. On Twitter, we're at ActorEngineer, and we'll see you next week. Until then.